Let me hear you say wrap up. Wrap up. Neuromancer. Dune. Asimov. Bradbury. Orwell. Dick. Stevenson. Huxley. Vonnegut. I'm Michael Leverts. This is Fit to be Read. Cue the intro. I'm excited for this haul because this is going to be the sort of mid-year wrap-up. This is going to encompass pretty much everything I've read between January to July up until now of this year. So I'm going to say it's going to be about 85 or 90 percent of everything that I've read. The first book on the wrap-up is Leviathan Wakes. This is by James S. A. Corey. Now James S. A. Corey is actually two people. It's Ty Frank and Daniel Abraham. So they wrote this book. This is the first book in the Expanse series. We're introduced to this really interesting universe of the solar system, basically. And we have Earth, Mars, and the asteroid belt. So those are sort of the major players, military political players. The belt, those who live in the belt are called the belters. And there's a lot of conflict, you know, is there going to be war? Is everybody getting together? We first meet this guy, James Holden. He is the XO of this ice hauling ship, the Canterbury. And they respond to a distress call and the ship they go to uh, is abandoned. And their ship that they came in while they're off the ship exploring this abandoned ship, that ship gets blown up and then, you know, chaos ensues from there. It's a really, you know, interesting, gripping first story. There's some interesting characters. We get James Holden, who is the main character in the book, along with the other main character, who is Detective Miller. We get two main characters here, and the story is told by their points of view. So we have a point of view from Holden, and then we get a point of view from Detective Miller, who's the other main character. And his story starts out, he works for a security police force, and he's trying to track down this missing girl who is the daughter of this really wealthy uh, CEO of a company. Interesting about this universe is that it just encompasses really our solar system, but those from Earth, Mars, and the belt seem almost like different races, even though it's all the human race, and that's a neat little trick that this book does. Also, we've got Caliban's War, which is the sequel to Leviathan Wakes. I felt this improved upon the first book. I really enjoyed this. There's a character in here, Avasarla, She's a feminist hero. She is a badass. She is a leader. She really makes this story. We now have four points of view in this story. So we have Holden, again, who is the main character in the first book. Miller um, has a presence in the second book, we'll say, but is not a main character uh, by any stretch of the imagination. We have another character, Roberta Draper, who is a badass Marine. And we get Praxilide Meng, who, sort of like the first book, we have an issue with a missing child. His child goes missing. He's working as a botanist on Ganymede. And Ganymede is, you know, the satellite of Jupiter that is responsible for supplying a lot of food and other things to the outer belt. He plays an interesting role in this story. These four different points of view are really interesting. The other one being Avasarla. She's sort of the UN... Politico who just gets stuff done. So the missing kid angle is a little bit similar to the first story, but it doesn't feel like a replay. And then we get this mysterious super soldier that appears and is killing Martians. When we first meet Roberta Draper, she's also on Ganymede and there is fighting that ensues and Martians are fleeing from this like giant super soldier who's just tearing through everybody. And from that point forward, the action really begins. There's a bit more action in this sequel than there was in the original but really for me it was the presence of four point of view chapters and then also the more interesting characters that made this a little bit better for me than leviathan wakes both were strong books both were fit to be read and it made me want to keep going in the series next up is a classic by arthur c Clarke, and this is rendezvous with rama 
again by Arthur C. Clarke. This is not a lot of action, but it's a really interesting story. It's very well respected. I enjoy it. It's a quick read. It's not that long. We've got, what, maybe, gosh, like 215 pages in this one. This one is not about the action. It's not explosive. There is a large, large ship that is discovered outside of Jupiter, just kind of passing on by. The uh, Earth sends a ship out to rendezvous with it, and the, the commander of the ship and his crew are sort of investigating inside the ship and seeing if there's going to be a first contact. They're introduced to some interesting technology of this alien race, and there is the cylindrical sea. There's just a lot of exploration going on, so it's not about the action in this. It's really about the exploration and the journey. This was also a Hugo award-winning novel. This book was really imaginative and it brings up a lot of questions about what would it be like for us to meet an alien race? How would we approach that alien race? How would they receive or perceive us or consider us? Or would they even consider us? Especially if they were a more advanced race, would they be interested in us or would we be like ants to them? So because this book brought up a lot of questions and didn't hit us over the head with the answer, I found it very much fit to be read. Next up is Alistair Reynolds, House of Sons. So this is a Welsh author who I really enjoy and I only just started reading him recently, uh, last year. And this is one of my favorite of his books. It's really interesting. It has, I think the thing that was most interesting about it for me was how it has a, it has a scene in it where there's a chase. And this chase spans like billions of years and it's done so effortlessly. The writing in this book by Alistair Reynolds is something very unique and it's very groundbreaking. The main premise of the story starts with a girl, I'm going to say her name was Abigail Gentian, and she has shatterlings. And what that means is she has cloned into a lot of different parts and each of her shatterlings like goes off into the universe and explore and then they have these reunions like every I don't know was it millions or billions of years or whatever and they'll go throughout the universe and then they report back and we get a real kind of interesting look at Abigail's personality through the different personalities of each of her shatterlings because the shatterlings are not all the same in terms of personality because of course your experience your travels and everything else are going to be parts of defining who you are but really the most interesting part of this is the fact that we're reading a story that spans billions of years and it's the same characters and it's just done effortlessly. A new release for this year is Project Hail Mary. This is by Andy Weir. Oh no, we're losing the jacket there. By Andy Weir, the ring light on there. Ah, boom, there, ah. I don't want that light on there. There it is, all right, so. I'm going to just put that in front of my face there. Project Hail Mary by Andy Weir. And Andy Weir, if you remember, is the author also of The Martian, which is also a very good book that I read a few years ago. This was, you know, really easy to get into right from the get-go. Our main character is this guy, Ryland Grace. And he wakes up. He doesn't even know he's Ryland Grace. He doesn't have his memory. Turns out he's on a spaceship. He's, so the first thing he has to do is figure that out. There's your first spoiler. It happens right away, so it's not a spoiler. And he's a high school or a junior high school science teacher, and he's somewhat disgraced because of this theory that he came up with in a paper about how if we met alien life, that it wouldn't necessarily have to be water-based. And guess what? There's some form of alien life that's creating a, a, an extinction-level event, possibly, and this life may or may not have composition including H that includes H2O. So of course he's the perfect person to bring in for this. That's a little bit hokey. It feels like a little bit like Nicolas Cage kind of movie. I think I also said that in the review. All of these books I'm talking about today, I've done a review on all of them too. So if any of them sound interesting to you, take a look at the reviews too. The reviews I do, they're always pretty much always spoiler free to start with. But always when there's going to be spoilers, it's always on the second half of the video and I kind of cut the video in half and I let you know now there's going to be spoilers. So if you want sort of more about these and you want it spoiler free, check out my other videos. This is one that I've done probably in the last month or so after I read it. This book was excellent. 
It's really gripping, captivating. It catches you right away. The fun part of this story is when Ryland realizes where he is and who he is and what he's doing. And throughout the story, we get little bits of it coming back and it's done at a really good pace. And then there's a relationship in this story that's really exciting. If you talk to anybody who've read this or after you have read it, the thing that you're gonna probably talk about the most is the relationship between the two main characters. Very well written, really great dialogue. This book is fit to be read. I can see behind me we've got Kazuo Ishiguro's Clara and the Sun. I'm laughing a little bit if you saw this review. I'm not as high on this book as I am on the other ones I've mentioned so far or the other ones I'll be mentioning. This one was one that was probably not, well, I just said that's not on the top of my list, but it's certainly close to the bottom of my list. Um, I don't give stars, but for me, this was like one star, maybe two stars at best. Ishiguro is a phenomenal writer. The writing in this is strong. The ideas fall flat. Um, there are a lot of authors, uh, Lem, Banks, Asimov, Dick, um, whom I also might think of, Reynolds. Uh, some of those are not in the pile here, but even within this pile, we've got Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? We've got uh, the Alistair Reynolds House of Sons, books that enlist non human characters or AI or robots. And it's part of the discussion of looking at what does it mean to be human? And that's sort of like the biggest overarching theme here is investigating what, does, what is humanity? What does it mean to be human? This, ball, this book falls very far short of the bar that those other giants of science fiction have set. Uh, it wasn't a hard read though. It's enjoyable. I don't think you get to the end of it and think, oh, I wish I hadn't read it. I didn't have the feeling of like, I wish I hadn't read it. Of Ishiguru, I'll say I agree with Margaret Atwood, who is on the cover here and calls him a master craftsman. And he's absolutely that. And even though, again, this wasn't my favorite book, you see that in this as well. He's an excellent, terrific writer. This just was not the book for me. The ideas do not stand up to similar things that I've seen within this genre. Last on our pile, for pile one is Frank Herbert's classic, Dune. Dune is set on the planet Arrakis. We start out on Caladan where we've got Duke Leto Atreides. The emperor has granted him stewardship of Arrakis. And all these planets are sort of like run like fiefdom. So Atreides is now in charge of Arrakis, House Atreides. Uh, Leto's son is Paul Atreides and we follow him for most of this story. There's sort of this messianic figure in, in Paul, and he maybe is, he's the chosen one. His mother is a Bene Gesserit. Bene Gesserits are really interesting characters in this universe. They have this really kind of interesting, time-shifting martial arts. They're these like really strong-minded, scheming politico types, uh, almost sort of mystical. And we also have a really great villain, the Baron von Harkonnen. Just listen to that name. It sounds like a great villain, and he is. Really important on Arrakis are the sandworms. Their secretions in the sand help to create the spice. The spice is called melange, and it imbues the user with vitality, longer life, and in some cases, uh, some cases prescience. So that's really important. So a lot of the politicking uh, has to do with who controls the spice. Very important work of science fiction. Absolutely, if I were giving stars, five-star read, hands down. Another classic, George Orwell's 1984, two plus two is five. So what am I talking about? The, this is one of the most classic, you know, dystopian novels. There, we have this perpetual war that we're always in and the government is just filled with propaganda. You're told how you think, how you act even what you believe. We have the thought police. If you're even thinking the wrong way, they know it. They're spying on you all the time. You're gonna get caught. In the story, we follow Winston Smith and we see how he interacts with the party, Ingsoc, who is responsible for all, the, all this propaganda. And we see how he is conditioned to love Big Brother and to love this dystopian world he lives in. 
what's really brilliant about this story is any generation since the time that this was written could claim it as their own and say, well, look, this predicted the type of future that we're living in or the type of present that we're living in. Yet another classic. This was a great first half of the year for reading because I'm going through read reads of so many classics. This one is no exception. Daniel Key's Flowers for Algernon. Okay, we're following Charlie Gordon. Charlie is a mentally challenged man and he undergoes this procedure that's supposed to make him more intelligent. So we follow him around and we have a really interesting writing style here in that we're looking at Charlie's journal entries for most of the book and it gives us a real even through how he writes it gives us a good sense of this character we get these great questions about you know does happiness get affected by greater intelligence uh, how do we treat people who are different than ourselves how do we receive them it's a heartbreaking story it's an emotional roller coaster We've got some really, not very deep characters, but characters that really illustrate really important aspects of what the author, I think, is trying to tell us. I think I read this book in about two days. It's a really fast read, and you really just want to know what happens to this character. There's some interesting characters in the book. They're not real deep characters, but they serve the purpose within Charlie's life to really look at these questions of how do we treat people who are different? What does it mean to be loved? What is it more valuable? Is it more valuable to be ignorant and happy and, and blissful in our ignorance? Or is it better to be of greater intelligence and to be more aware of what's going on, even if the things that you're aware of are things that don't make you happy? What's next? Remote Control by Nnedi Okorafor. This was a nice surprise this year. This is a little novella. Nnedi Okorafor is quickly becoming one of my favorites to read. She's written Who Fears Death, uh, the Binti series, which is great, Lagoon, which is great. I think all of those are going to be on my, I'm sure I'm going to do a top 100 list at some point, but they'll all be on there. Um, this one may not make it on there. I might dock it because it's a novella. I probably shouldn't do that, but um, it's just, it's, it's a good read. I don't know that it's in my top top. But what I really like about it is it's a unique setting for science fiction, not necessarily for Nettie, a core for, but for, you know, versus all the other things that I'm reading. This is set in Ghana. We get really interesting descriptions of Ghana. Uh, the main character is uh, this girl, Sankofa. Something falls from the sky, sort of imbues her with some mystical or magical powers. People around her are dying. Uh, it affects how people treat her. So we get a really interesting uh, look at her, her journey. And she has this little fox, I think his name was called Movenpeck, and he follows her around. This is something that I've recommended to a lot of people because it's not necessarily something you'd recommend, hey, I want to read science fiction for the first time. This might not fit the bill for that, but for somebody who maybe reads science fiction has said, hey, I'm looking for something a little bit different or a palate cleanser. This is a really good palate cleanser, and I mean that with the most respect and with a high amount of praise. Following Remote Control, we've got another novella, and this one I believe won a Hugo Award and a Nebula Award, or one or the other. Uh, you can look that up, because I'm not gonna look it up right now. This is This Is How You Lose the Time War by Max Gladstone and Amal el Motar. This was interesting, and again, this is another one that's like, it's not like a lot of other science fiction that I would read. It's kind of more of a love story that has a science fiction element. We have these two agents, red and blue. They are not necessarily birds, but they can take on other forms. One is more kind of tech-based and one is more organic. If I've lost you already, that's okay. There's a lot of that going on in the story. They are agents and they're in this ongoing war through space and time. Very interesting. These two agents on opposing sides develop sort of a love story together, and there's a little bit of a Romeo Juliet kind of feel to it, forbidden love, and they're leaving notes for one another. I think a lot of people really love this because of how poetic the prose is. I will say in the review, I think I did two reviews of this on the channel, which you can look for. One I think was five likes and five dislikes, more spoilery, and then another one was a shorter sort of cozy, spoiler-free version. So if you're interested, you can take a look at that. My kind of complaint was in like maybe the first half of the book, the dialogue back and forth in these letters felt a little bit YA to me, and this is not intended to be YA, so that is a little bit of a knock on it. 
And I will say that the second half of the book is very, very poetic and really pretty writing, but it's sort of like two different things in the same book. Fit to be read because I do know a lot of people who read this and make a very good case for why they liked it. I mean, no case is more important than I liked it. And when this was my taste, I didn't dislike it. I enjoyed it. It was not my favorite book of the year. One more entry this year for the Expanse series. This is Abaddon's Gate. I just finished reading this one. I have a review going up on this one shortly. I'm not sure if this wrap up is gonna beat it. But yeah, this wrap up will probably beat this onto my uploads. And Abaddon's Gate is great. We've got James Holden back, he, captain of the Rosinante and his crew with Naomi, Amos, Alex. If you haven't read any of that, those names mean nothing to you. If you have, those people are back. We have four points of view again. So the first book, Leviathan Wakes, we had two points of view. In Caliban's War, we had four. And in this one, we also have four. Holden is the only one that is the same. And one of the things I didn't like is Ava Sarla, who is the really interesting character in the second book, is not really in this one. Her name is mentioned maybe once. So that's sort of a, a, a miss. What I will say is this starts out kind of slow. And at this point in the series, that shouldn't happen. It shouldn't take me like 100 pages to be like, okay, now I'm into this story. But when you're introducing new main characters, I guess there is a little bit of that buildup. So I'll kind of give it a pass for that. And we have Anna, who is a... She's, a, I think, a Methodist. It doesn't matter. It's some sort of a, a, a reverend. Uh, she is a lesbian. She has a wife and a child who she leaves to go on this mission to investigate something. And I'm being very vague because this is the third book, and I don't want to spoil any of the books on this. So she goes on this fleet out to the outer reaches of the solar system, where everybody else in the story is pretty much going to. We've still have got this intrigue between Earth, Mars, the belt, the three major political forces, three major military forces, sort of. And we've got Holden again, he's involved in this. We have a new character, Bull, and he's with the Belters. And he is sort of this kind of no-nonsense, gets things done kind of guy. And he goes on with the Belters, even though he is not a Belter. So because of that, he sort of goes on board of the ship as the security chief, whereas he's really more qualified to be the captain or the XO. But for political reasons, and because this is really important and the crew is all belters, we've got to make sure that the captain and the, and the XO are also belters. Then we have Melba, who I can't tell you who she is. I'm just going to say we have Melba. This is just my wrap up. This is not necessarily meant to be a review. If you want to know more about this book, check out the review when it's up and it's posted. And those are our characters. We've got Bull, we got Melba, we got Anna, and we've got Holden. All right, so that covers it. The main thing I'll say about this, this was a really great read. I still think so far the best of the series was the second one, Caliban's War, up to this point in the series. But what I'll say that's unique about this one that exceeds the others is when you get to the second half of this book, this is the first time in the series where the book is absolutely unputdownable. There's some really interesting po ship-wide politics and universe-wide, well, solar system-wide politics that get really interesting, and it's hard to put the book down. So this is the first time where the series is unputdownable, and that makes it fit to be read. Whereas Expanse is a really nice, now this is one where I would say, hey, good recommendation, you're just getting into science fiction or you wanna get into science fiction, want something that's gonna kinda grab you, grip you, pull you in, the Expanse series is a really good recommendation. I can probably give you 10 more. Expanse is a good one, and I think that's one that would be on a lot of people's lists. People who read a lot of science fiction will pick that one as like, okay, here's a good series to jump in with. This next book is not probably as well known. The author is an absolute brilliant writer of hard science fiction, probably very underrated, but not as accessible, I think, and certainly would not be something you would say to somebody who's asking you, hey, I may be interested in science fiction. What do you got for me for a first entree? This is not it. This is Dichronauts by Greg Egan. I, you may not have heard of this one. Uh, that's not surprising. Uh, he's also the author of uh, Axiomatic, Diaspora, Shield's Ladder, Permutation City, Maybe you've heard one of those. I think Diaspora is probably maybe his more most famous novel, but he writes hard science fiction. This is no exception. We're in this hyperboloid 
world with a star ro that rotates around it on this really kind of tilted strange axis. And because of, we, because of it, we have these habitable zones. The characters, the people, the aliens that inhabit this habitable zone are really interesting. They're walkers and siders. They're symbiotes. So in this symbiont relationship, the walker is the upright, ambulatory person, creature, whatever, who can move, right? This is different than our universe, though. Whereas we have three dimensions of space and one dimension of time, this universe is two dimensions of space and two dimensions of time. So we could probably just stop right there and think about that for a little while, about what that might look like or what that might mean. But real quickly, we've got these walkers who are the ambulatory part of the creature. Then we have siders. So the walkers, they can see forward or they can tilt their head backwards and they can see backwards. And that's it because they're two, in a two-dimensional world. So if they tried to even rotate, which is impossible, they would just, or if they fell, they would like elongate along the horizon. I can't explain it any better than that. So what they have are inside their skull, threaded through their skulls, they have these siders and they ping and they use echolocation to sort of see. So the cider and the walker together form this symbiont relationship where they can pretty much have full field of vision. This book is so mind bending, but it's so enjoyable. And the story is actually really good. So the science, the math, the geometry, and the physics are mind blowing again. But it's so enjoyable. The story is great. The characters have so much personality. It can be difficult at times because if there's like four people in a group, you're really talking about eight people because the, the cider and the walker have distinct personalities and, and character to them. So you're looking at like really eight characters to sort of keep track of. But the story is really interesting and you feel for these characters. And it's really interesting to sort of discover their world as they discover it too. Five stars, absolutely, if I'm giving stars. Wonderful book, I highly recommend it. Here's another 2021 release, and this is a debut novel. This is Micaiah Johnson's The Space Between Worlds. So this was a really nice surprise. I didn't know what to expect with this. I had a maybe four or five, I think, new releases this year that I took a look at. This was, this along with Project Hail Mary were the two best. This is one that in five or 10 years from now, I'm still gonna be recommending to people. And again, I'll put this into that category of like, hey, I'm new to science fiction. I don't wanna go too, too deep into it. A lot of times I like to go space opera for that, but this is one that I would look at as well if I weren't going space opera. This is multiple worlds, multiple dimensions. We are following Kara in this, and she is able to go between dimensions. She just can't go to worlds where her doppelganger exists. So obviously in each dimension we have different versions of ourself. Somebody's killing off several of her doppelgangers. So that's sort of a mystery in the story. There's a lot of suspense. It's a thrilling read. There's a lot of diversity in the story. We look at privilege. There are non-binary characters in this story. There's a lot in here. If you're looking for something a little bit different, and you want to maybe discover a new author. I don't know if she's working on anything else, but this is a really great first entry for Micaiah Johnson. Sticking with the theme of new releases, we've got We Could Be Heroes by Mike Chen. This one I bought before it was released on pre-order. I wasn't sure what to expect. I do like the cover. And I think at the time, I don't know why it jumped out at me, but I thought, I think I was just so interested in reading some new stuff this year because I read so much classics and all of the classics are, I've read so much science fiction. So most of these are like rereads. I'm like, I got to get some fresh stuff in. And I think I just looked at a list of like, what was new stuff coming out this year? And this one kept showing up on list. So I got it. All right. I, this is one of the few books that I almost DNF'd this year. Um, I'm glad I didn't, not because like I ended up loving it, but it was a decent read. I don't like to DNF anything. Like, you know, I, if you're reading something and you don't like it and you DNF, great. You know, that makes sense. For me, I'm just stubborn. If I start reading something, it's very hard for me to not finish it. And I think like anybody who writes a book generally writes a decent enough book that if you get to the end, you're going to have some level of satisfaction with it. I was satisfied with this. It... The reason I was going to DNF it was it just wasn't what I was looking for. This isn't the typical science fiction story. It's more like superheroes. This story follows two people who have superhuman powers and there's an issue with like, again, recovering memory. So this is another one where we're dealing with like memory recovery stuff. So if you like that kind of book, and I know a lot of people that do like that kind of stuff, 
this is a good kind of dive into the like, oh, I woke up and I don't know who I am, but I've got these powers. How did I get them? That's an interesting part of the story, absolutely. Uh, the characters are interesting because one of them I think is like a Postmates or an Uber Eats driver. I don't think they call it Postmates or Uber Eats in here. And one of them is a bank robber. And they actually have to meet up and then figure out how to work together, even though they were sort of on opposing sides before. That's kind of fun, exciting. One has superpower and flight as their powers, and the other one is a telepath. So this was a good read. If that sounds like the kind of thing that you'd like, this is a really, really good book for that. It just wasn't what I was looking for in my reading at that time. I'm glad I read it. It was worth my time. Next up, Kurt Vonnegut and Slaughterhouse Five. So Slaughterhouse Five is a classic. Kurt Vonnegut is obviously one of our most regarded authors in science fiction. This is a great representation of his work. It is fit to be read for a number of reasons. We follow Billy Pilgrim and we see different aspects of his life. We see him when he is a young and awkward soldier, but then we also see him as an older guy dealing with like dementia and PTSD and things like that. There are flashbacks in here. We have aliens, the Tralfamadorians, that look kind of like this. Uh, they're green with like finger, like tendrils on the head and a big eye right in the center. And this somewhat reflects, you know, Vonnegut gets experience and interest in the bombings that happened in Dresden. And we see Billy Pilgrim in a lot of the flashbacks, his experience there in Dresden during this bombings. And then later on in his life, we have a lot of the repercussions of that. So there's quite a bit of commentary about trauma and how we deal with trauma and treat trauma. Another classic, Aldous Huxley, Brave New World. This is Huxley's imagining of a dystopian future where individuals favor contentment and consumerism above all else. Aiding this contentment is this drug that everybody takes. It's called Soma. And we live in this world where, you know, geneticists create the people and put them in different classes. And obviously people are separated by intelligence and ability and things like that. We meet this interesting character, John the Savage, who is on this reservation and is not part of this brave new world. So it's really interesting to see how he's going to interact. We've got some orgies going on in this joint. This is a phenomenal, phenomenal story. You know, I think of our big three in dystopian literature as, for me, we've got Huxley's Brave New World, we've got 1984 by George Orwell, and Fahrenheit 451, which isn't in this pile because I read it most recently last year, but those are sort of my three favorite. This is probably my favorite of the three. Huxley's commentary on the power of the unchecked state such a relevant message. This is one of these books that, you know, I talk about recommendations. I recommend this book for anybody to read. I'd say the same thing about Fahrenheit 451 and George Orwell's 1984 as well. Okay, next up is Balzac and the Little Chinese Seamstress. What is this doing in here? This is not science fiction. There is a reason why I read this novella this year. My friend Brian sent me to this because I was telling him about the three body problem uh, after I read it and how much I like the beginning of that book because it talks about the Chinese cultural revolution. And it's an area of history, an era of history that I'm not that familiar with. And we were talking about it and he said, oh, you might like this book. And I did, I really liked it. So this is uh, following these sort of two city boys during the Chinese Revolution and they're sent to a re-education camp on the side of this mountain in this very small town. They discover a stash of books and it's all classic literature and they're just enamored by it. They meet the little Chinese seamstress and they're flirting with her and it's just a really good look at like it doesn't examine the Chinese Cultural Revolution. It's just set during that time period and the whole setting is affected by that. So this was a really great entry to read right after that. And I think I said palate clencher before for something else. This was definitely a, a, blah, 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 a palate cleanser uh, from science fiction. I of course immediately went right back to science fiction. Come on, are you kidding me? But Balzac and the Little Chinese Seamstress by Dai Zizhi, 
I love this novella and I will recommend this to anybody because it's fit to be read. Next up, did somebody say classics? How much more classic does it get than the War of the Worlds? So in the War of the Worlds, we have Martians invading London and Surrey and that whole area there. And they come in, these giant cylinders, and in the cylinders we've got these giant tri tripod, tripod creatures that have these heat lasers. And it's really interesting because this is told in the voice of the narrator who sounds like a journalist or a documentarian, which really helps to get, get us into the mood here. And this is obviously written a long time ago. I think it's like 1897, 1898. This book is really old. It's dated. That this is written in the voice of the narrator who feels like a journalist, it really helps to like kind of put us into this and it feels almost like a historical documentation of something that actually happened. And this is a must read for anybody who loves science fiction and wants to know canon and wants to really look at the roots of science fiction. This is one of our very first invasion by aliens stories, and it's a really good one. We haven't even developed flight yet, so in this, the Martians have a, a are developing a flying machine, which at that time, flight is science fiction. So this was really fun. Dated, yes, but not in a way that the dated makes it unenjoyable or hard to read. This next one is just really cool. Dare I say, another one of my favorites. Neuromancer, I gotta get this cover in here. So this is, I think, like the Brazilian cover. I just had to have this one, it's really cool. There's a Japanese cover and an Italian cover and a Portuguese cover that I really want to, but it's really hard to find those ones. But I have about four or five different covers. I might do a short at some point and just show off all those covers because I really like them. But this is definitely one of my favorites. There we go. And here's another copy. I'm not even sure, this might be a Chinese version here. And then of course I do have an English version back here somewhere. Um, this is one of the few books where I have like 10 different editions of it. Neuromancer is exciting. It's, you know, it's groundbreaking. It's new. It's like the first foray into cyberpunk by the originator of this subgenre, William Gibson. Neuromancer for a lot of folks, myself included, is not an easy read at first. There's so many new terms that we're introduced to. And some of the terms we're introduced to, you know, might be a term for something and that something has three different terms like a Hosaka or a deck or a Onai Sendai. Or I, I can't even remember the names of them all at this point. I would have to pick up the book again and look at it. But, you know, we might have three different names for just the computer deck. We also have cyberspace. This is the first time I think we've seen this term used in literature. And cyberspace, which you might think, okay, well, we know what that is, but cyberspace doesn't mean exactly what we think of as cyberspace. What we think of as cyberspace now is really the matrix. So that's all going on. You know, you can jack into, right into your brain, into like virtual reality. All of this was really, really revolutionary. A lot of it has been copied since Neuromancer. We have this interesting protagonist, Case, who is a hacker. Uh, he hooks up because he's recruited by this AI winter mutant. He doesn't know that that's who he's recruited by at first. That's not really a spoiler, but this whole team of interesting people are put together to uh, kind of go on this particular mission, which I won't get into that to spoil anything. We get this woman, Molly, who is sort of the muscle. We have Case, they're working together. How they work together, their character, their life, this sort of cyberpunk setting, all of it meshes together perfectly to create a wonderful and a beautiful story. I recommend this highly. It is fit to be read for so many reasons because it's a great story, because it's captivating, because it's interesting, because it's groundbreaking. Did I say that already? Neuromancer. Who's in the mood for another classic? Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? By Philip K. Dick. All right, so this is the book that the movie Blade Runner is loosely based off of. This is one of my top three. Sometimes it's my top, sometimes it's my second or my third. One of my top three Philip K. Dick novels, author of Man in the High Castle, Ubik, uh, A Scanner Darkly, and several other great stories. So this is following Rick Deckard, 
the Earth has been damaged by a nuclear war, World War Terminus it's called, and most people have fleed the Earth. Some have stayed behind because they have to or because they've been irradiated and so they're not going to be part of the new civilizations that are going out to space and Mars and elsewhere. And some people stay to work, some people just want to stay. Deckard is there because he's a bounty hunter and he is hunting androids that who have escaped back to the Earth. And relating to the title of the book, Electric Sheeps, people on Earth have ownership of animals as a status symbol. Animals are very rare, so if you own an animal, it's really seen as a high level of status, especially like a bigger animal like a horse. A sheep is decent. Uh, but some people can't afford those or don't have those. Some people elect for these pseudo animals, the electric versions, and they're very hard to distinguish. So there's the title, The Electric Sheep. This story does a great job, like I mentioned before, of kind of looking at this question of what does it mean to be human? We have these androids who are really convincing replicants of human beings. And here's Deckard who has a job of like killing them. And he has to identify like, is this an android or is this a real person and there's a test he can administer. We get a little bit of a focus on empathy in this book and again a really great look at what does it mean to be human. This was a book that I tore through and I'm probably likely to read it again I don't know in another two or three years. I highly recommend this to anybody who wants their kind of first look at Philip K. Dick. I think this is the perfect first novel to jump in for him. Moving back into hard science fiction, that also means we're moving back in with Greg Egan, Incandescence. This is a really, again, another interesting, very different, very unique, very hard science fiction, very trippy. We're looking at two different sort of points of view. One of those points of view is this world where that everything that could be reached and discovered has been, and that's a very interesting place to start from. This is a book that's very difficult to discuss in 30 seconds, so I'm just going to leave it at there's two really interesting points of view in this story. Really interesting universe is built, and there's a little bit more physics lesson than I might like, but that's also something that you'll come to expect with Greg Egan, and I feel just a little bit smarter <laughs> for it, and also a little bit dumber as I read it, but his books, there is a lot of sort of, you have to persevere. And I think when you look at a book and you hear, you know, you have to persevere for that, that's not a positive thing. It's generally a negative thing. It's not a negative thing here. Some books you persevere through them and it's worthwhile, both because like there's a sense of accomplishment when you finish a book like this. And beyond just a sense of accomplishment, it's not just like, whoa, that was nice. I was able to make it through. But there's also a really good story there. And I think that's what's missed a lot in critics of Greg Egan is that there, there's hard science fiction. And I think sometimes people feel like within the hard science fiction, the victim is the storytelling. But the storytelling is really good. I didn't love this as much as I love Dikronauts, but I do like this. And it's something that if I'm going to do a top 100, it's probably going to be in that top 100. I'd have to it's actually something I've been working on and it's taking me forever. I think I've pared down from about 400 science fiction books all the way down to about 160. So I have to figure out if I'm going to make it a 160 science fiction list or if I'm just going to make like have like 10 ties for 150. Because you get to like number 150 and it's like, is this better than that? And like, yes it is, but the writing is stronger on this. We'll figure it out, right? More classics from classic authors. The Martian Chronicles by Ray Bradbury, if we turn that the right side up there. This is a series of short stories that was put together. This is like, I would say this is going to be in my top 10 or top 20, but it's funny because I was doing that 100 list and I was looking at these books that would be, top, would be top 20s and there's like 40 of them, so it's not going to happen. So I don't know if this will make it top 10, but probably top 20, easily the top 30, which is actually really good. Ray Bradbury, you should be proud of yourself. You get in my top 30. Um, Ray Bradbury, one of the greatest science fiction writers of all time, fantasy, all different types of genres, but um, his science fiction works are great. This is one of my absolute favorites of his. 
and the writing is, is really great. What's really unique about this book and for the time that it was written as well, we have stories of like, you know, Mars attacks or, you know, first contact with aliens or it usually looks like what it's going to be like if they come to us. This is us going to sort of occupy Mars and the stories are just really brilliantly written and I kind of like that they were short stories that were put together because you get all these different little vignettes. You know, one of the ones early in the story that I think is my favorite is they're going to colonize Mars and they go send this expedition and everybody thinks they're crazy. You know, they're knocking on doors like, hey, first contact, we're here, greet us. And the people are like, dude, you people are crazy. Yeah, you got a spaceship. So they just think that they're crazy people. Eventually, you know, we get to this psychiatrist's office and he's talking to this, the, the guy from Earth and the guy from Earth is like, you know, nobody believes me, whatever. And the psychiatrist is like, okay, you're crazy. Here's, here's the cure, or here's how we deal with that. And he shoots the guy. And then another expedition comes and, you know, they show up and it's like this ideal small town America and it's all kind of in their heads. So it's really interesting what happens each time each new expedition shows up to Mars. This is really worth a read. Look how small it is. You can get through this quickly. It's less than 200 pages. I will highly recommend this. And I wasn't thinking of this before when I did this, but again, this is another one. If you tell people like, hey, I'd like to get into classic science fiction, I think this is a great one too because, you know, you can, if you want to sell it, you can say, look, this is a great book, but it's made up of short stories. So if you don't like it, read two or three of them. And then if you don't like it, put it down. But I think the thing is, the great thing about this the book gets a little bit, the stories get a little bit weirder and more unique as you go. But I think the best and the strongest material are the early ones. So I think you can get somebody caught in on that if that's your goal, you know, oh, we got to pull all these people into science fiction. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you want to recommend something good for people to read, this is a good book for people to read. All right, let's move over here because that makes the most sense. And we've got We Are the Ants. This is a very recent review on my channel read this for Pride Month because we have a gay main character. The main character here is Henry Denton. Yeah, Henry Denton. And Henry is, has been abducted and is regularly being abducted by aliens since the age of 13. Why are they abducting him? I don't know, but they're giving him an option. If he pushes this big red button, he can stop this impending end of the world scenario that the aliens have let him know about and he has to decide so you think like oh, yeah of course i'm going to push the button well this guy's dealing with grief and trauma his boyfriend has killed himself and his life is not so easy either he's bullied even within his own, in his own family um, and he's still dealing with guilt and the loss of his boyfriend so this is a, a ya read so i don't read a lot of ya i was really pleasantly surprised and really pleased with this book. The writing is really strong and we get a nice look at issues of trauma, depression, you know, mature themes like suicide. And this is written by Sean David Hutchinson. So this whole next pile is all Remembrance of Earth's Past Trilogy. So there's three books in this trilogy. There's actually a fourth book too, but for the purpose of this, there's three books in the trilogy. I've read all three this year. Three body problem. I love top 10 lists. I see this one in a lot of people's top 10 lists. This is not in my top 10. The series is for sure, because it's a great series. The first book is, I'm not going to say mediocre, but the fact that I brought up the word, you can kind of read between the lines there, because it is really interesting. It's, it's different. It's uh, the first, I think, Asian uh, written novel to win a Hugo Award. And this was, I believe, written in 2008. And then I think it won the Hugo in 2014 or 15 because it was then translated into English. The author is Shixin Liu, and he is a very prolific science fiction writer in China. And this was really kind of interesting because we do start out in the Chinese Cultural Revolution, like I mentioned before. The beginning of the story, we this woman is seeing her father, you know, B 
beaten and uh, you know because he betrayed the state because of what he was teaching. So later on she is a scientist and she finds this way to send a message to an alien civilization. Well the alien civilization that she's sending this to and that she accomplishes the ability to get this signal out there is the Trisolarans. And the Trisolarans are dealing a little problem of their own. They have a three-body problem. The three bodies being these three suns that are in proximity to their planet. And because of the rotation, and sometimes the planet is really close to one sun or far away or close to two suns, the, the planet is either like completely uninhabitable and everything burns up, or there's a stable period. So they have stable periods and chaotic periods and they can't figure out what to do. Yep, there's a, the society is really interesting. They can dehydrate themselves when they know that there's a chaotic period coming and then they can store themselves and then somehow they get rehydrated during the stable periods. Really kind of wild idea there. There's also an interesting virtual reality element to this book in that there's this sort of game that's created where the Trisolarans can communicate with specific chosen folks from Earth, generally smart people and scientists, that allow them to look at this problem of the three body and try to come up with solutions. And that doesn't really happen. There's a lot of sort of uh, discussion of nanotechnology in this book. It's a little bit science heavy. The characters are, characterizations really kind of weak in it. And the story is just kind of okay. If there was no other book in this series, I would still say this is a good book, it's fit to be read, and it's worth reading because it is really interesting. In a ways I can't explain, the fact that this was written by somebody from a culture that's very different than my own comes through. And again, it's in a way that I can't really articulate. This was a strong read. What was even better than this, oh, and I should show off this too. We also have a different cover for this one. This is the Chinese version of the cover for the three body problem. Look at that, that's pretty cool. All right, then we've got the sequel, which was The Dark Forest. Now, this is the best of the series, The Dark Forest. We've got two copies here again, two different versions. That one's probably kind of cool. Let's take a look at this one. This one actually kind of, I think the jacket yeah, sort of opens up, so that's actually a cutout there. And then you can see the actual cover. Interesting sort of jacket there. So again, Sheik Xin Lu. The Dark Forest. This is a really interesting look or dive into, you know, what if we reach out to an alien race or an alien culture, what would that look like? How would they respond to us? What would that reaction be? And what I can tell you is the answer to that question is what makes this so brilliant. And I will say, and I've said this in the review here, this will, this has changed how I look at, you know, our place in the universe and how I view the idea of first contact. That is forever changed, and I think for a lot of people that read this, you'll feel the same way. Again, the characterizations are not great in this. This is not a series about the characters. There's definitely some problems with the characters in this too. And you know, there's one character that's like, it's pretty misogynistic at one point. I don't necessarily think it's the author putting his own misogyny into the book. I think it's just, that's who that character is. I'm not making any excuses for it. The story is amazing. The idea is amazing. Now, while that is the best of the series, the next is the most epic. And I gotta get it. Death's End by Shikshin Lu. And this one is translated by Ken Lu, who also translated the first book. The second book was translated by Joel Martinson, if that's important to you. That means nothing to me because I can't read Chinese. But this is the most epic. This book is mind-bending. It's trippy. There's so many giant ideas. And just when you think you've gotten like the big interesting idea of the book, then there's another one. And then there's another one. We've got multiple universes and multiple dimensions. We have two-dimensional space and what that looks like, four dimensions of space. It's just really all over the place in a good way. It's not the best written of the series, but it is the most epic and there's so much going on. This, like the other two books, is absolutely fit to be read. The scope of this is just unbelievable. 
and it's definitely the most action-packed of the three books as well. So that's the wrap-up version of this video, January through July. There's a couple titles that are probably not here, but that's the ones that I really wanted to talk about. Next up, what am I currently reading? And TBR. There's also a few TBRs that I'm probably going to read pretty soon that aren't sitting right here as well, but I don't want to make this an hour-long video. So the first one I'm going to look at, and these are kind of out of order, Gideon the Ninth. I'm not actually sure if I'm going to get to this one right away. This was recommended to me by the Booktube Goddess. I keep thinking I'm going to try to get myself back into a little bit more fantasy, and this is sort of one that I believe is supposed to maybe straddle both science fiction and fantasy. Definitely can tell by this cover here that there uh, is uh, a look of fantasy here. And this is by, written by Tasman Muir, and I think that's the first time I actually looked to see who this was written by. I just took it on faith uh, to buy this based off of the recommendation. And I think this is something about necromancing something or other. Let's see. Tam Tamson Muir's Gideon the Ninth unveils a solar system of swordplay. So, so I got solar system, I got my sci-fi there, swordplay, I got my fantasy, uh, cutthroat politics, and lesbian necromancers. Her characters leap off the page as skillfully animated as arcane revenants. The result is a heart-pounding epic science fantasy. And I don't know about you, because I can see why that might not just catch you right away. I mean, obviously, lesbian necromancers jumps out at you, but does it catch you to say, oh, I'd like to read that? Just that little blurb there makes me think, you know what, I think this is going to be a fun read for me, and I'm looking forward to it. And I think it'll be fun to do a review on this one, too. So it's on my initial TBR, but we'll see if we get to that, and, and we'll see how quickly. Here's the only other thing that we're going to look at that's not science fiction. I talk about this one a lot because this is my long-term book. I always have a long-term book going. Uh, once I get through this one, the next one's going to be Count of Monte Cristo. I think that's the one that's supposed to be next. Uh, it's been on the waiting list for a while. This is The Far Pavilions. This is actually not the copy I'm reading. The copy I'm reading has already lost the cover, the back cover, and like three of the back pages. So I have this one when I get to the end because then I'm going to have to use it for the last three pages. Because I've been reading this book so long, it's just getting destroyed. And I wasn't intending it to be a two-year long read. It is a long book. What is this? How many pages? I'm not going to find exactly, but we're close to 1,000 pages here. 954 on this copy. And I love the book. It's just really good. The setting is in India and... God, how do I summarize the 700 pages I've read so far? We're uh, following a really interesting character. What the hell is his name? It's Ash. So we're following this character, Ash, and he's not a perfect character. I mean, he definitely has his character flaws. He makes some bad decisions, and it's really a great character because it's not, a, it's not somebody who's just like this white knight or anything like that. We see him traveling across India during, you know, time of war and strife and hiding, dealing with death. There's a part where I am now, which I don't want to spoil, so I'm not going to spoil it. But he's chasing after this princess who he's in love with, like a real princess, not a Disney princess. But the point is, I've been reading this for a while, and what happens is I end up maybe reading three or four of these books, and I'm like, oh wait, i got to go back to Far Pavilions. And it's really good and it's easy to go back to because I can pick up right where I left off, even if it's been months, and I still know where I am in the story. That's an amazing aspect of that book because my memory, like I was reviewing these books, I had to keep looking at notes, and I just read these books. But I know exactly where I am on this book, and that's not a knock on these books too. It's just something about this book particularly. I can read 10 pages at a time and I'll leave it for a few more months and come back. I'm going to try to stop doing this thing where I just read 10 pages at a time because that's going to take me forever. But that's just been the last kind of three or four times I went to it. Probably the next time I'll, I'll take a bigger chunk out of it. Really great book. That's a book I'll recommend to anybody outside of the science fiction genre. Next up, ooh, Isaac Asimov Foundation, greatest science fiction ever written, end of story. I'm going to get to that because, again, if I'm going to do top 10 lists, top 100 lists, top 200 lists, got to like read this again. Uh, I've read this three times. I think the last time I read it was probably 20 years ago. 
It was my all-time favorite. When I read it again, it's gonna still be that way. But you never know, you have to go back. Greatest villain of all time in science fiction is the mule, which is actually not in the foundation, but in starts out in the sequel, Foundation and Empire, and then second foundation. Uh, I'm looking forward to giving Harry Seldon and the mule another reread. Stranger in a Strange Land, Robert Heinland. This is a classic. Again, this is something that actually feels really dated, but I'm giving this another read. This is classic science fiction. We've got Michael Valentine. What is his name again? It's Valentine Michael Smith, Ancestry Human, Origin, Mars. So he comes back from Mars and this sort of follows what he goes through and what he brings to the table here on Earth. Feels dated. A lot of the writing, you know, especially like male characters and female characters together, very dated, sometimes kind of uncomfortable. Not uncomfortable like, oh, I can't handle this, but just uncomfortable like, ah, that's kind of cringeworthy. But it's an enjoyable read. It's fit to be read because it's a classic. 20 years ago, this would be something that would be like one of my tops, but like reading it with more mature and more worldly eyes, I definitely see that it's different. And this is one that's really just kind of dropped down the list for me, but it doesn't change the fact that it's a classic. And like, if you ever look at lists of like science fiction, you should read whatever the should is. This is one of those just because it's sort of, you know, foundational for science fiction and it occupies a role in classic science fiction. All right. That's as much as I'm going to say about that. Neil Stevenson's Snow Crash more cyberpunk. This is a really excellent one. This is another one that's like, okay, top 20, but there's like 30 things in the top 20. So is this going to be in the top 20 or not? You're going to have to watch the video when I do it and find out. And iRobot. This is another one that this is easily in the top 10, just like foundation. So it's got to get another reread. This one's interesting because this is more like short stories in this first book. And then Caves of Steel, the sequel, is really where this gets going and it's really great. So I got to decide, am I going to, if I do the top 10, is iRobot and Caves, Steel, Caves of Steel going to go in as one entry or is it going to go in as two? Because that's hard to do because if you start doing that, you can really fill up your list. Like, should Ender's Game, uh, Speaker for the Dead, Xenocide, Ender's Shadow, Shadow of the Hegemon, should all those books like be like crowding the top 20 along with Foundation, Foundation and Empire, iRobot, Caves of Steel. You know, you're not gonna have room for anything else. It's just gonna be all Isaac Asimov and all the Enders series. And that wouldn't be fair, would it? Maybe, I guess you'll just have to watch that video and find out what I do. So Asimov is the master of writing science fiction and space opera, but also the master of robots, the three laws of robotics. This is a must read, one of the great works of science fiction. So that's it for wrap up TBR. I hope you'll comment below if you've read any of these books, if you have thoughts on any of them, please put it in the comments. Please subscribe. Please click the notification bell because YouTube will let you know every Thursday at one o'clock when I release new content. Please comment. I'd love to go back and forth talking about any number of these books. I'd love to hear your thoughts and I'd love to tell you even more of my thoughts on each of these books.